Happy Pentecost Sunday, everyone. As you can see, we're adorned in red here. I'm talking about Holy Spirit fire, and we'll get into that for our message for today. First, we're going to go over our uh, lesson readings for today, starting with a first lesson, doing a psalm reading, and then also a second lesson. Our first lesson for today is from the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, verses 24 through 30. So Moses went out and reported the Lord's words to the people. He gathered the seventy elders and stationed them around the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Then he gave the seventy elders the same spirit that was upon Moses. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But this never happened again. Two men, Eldad and Medad, had stayed behind in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but they had not gone out to the tabernacle. Yet the Spirit rested upon them as well. So they prophesied there in the camp. A young man ran and reported to Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, had been Moses' assistant since his youth, protested, Moses, my master, make them stop. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. Then Moses returned to the camp with the elders of Israel. Our psalm reading for today is from Psalm number 25. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 15. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right and teaches his way to the lowly. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, forgive my sin, for it is great. Who are they who fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They shall dwell in prosperity, and their offspring shall inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him and will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever looking to the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and have pity on me, for I am left alone and in misery. Our second lesson reading for today is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, and we are going to be taking a look at verses 1 through 21. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia. Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, 
And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there, amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, They're just drunk after all. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This concludes our readings for this morning because today is Pentecost Sunday, which is the 50th day after our Lord's resurrection on Easter Sunday. On this day, we celebrate Jesus' Holy Spirit coming down upon and empowering the disciples to go out and testify to everything Jesus said and did. It's a Sunday where the color red is predominant to represent the fire of Jesus' Holy Spirit that is available to all who believe in Him. And it's this Holy Spirit of Jesus that we are going to focus on today. There's a man, uh, John Wimber, who is one of the founding members of the Vineyard Movement. And he was also a product of the Jesus Movement back in the 1960s. Now, John Wimber had met Jesus in a dramatic way. And so, John immediately began reading the New Testament, beginning with the Gospels and then going on to the book of Acts. John was excited about what he was reading and what the early church was doing. However, when he then went to his local church on a Sunday morning, he became quite disillusioned. The polite and tidy service was very undramatic and quiet. After the service was finished, John Wimber then looked at some of the people around him and said, When are you going to do this stuff? What stuff? They wanted to know. And John said, you know, the Holy Spirit stuff. John had been reading about the conversions, the healings and deliverance, and all the other miracles that took place in the early church recorded in the book of Acts in the Bible. However, instead of signs and wonders, he didn't see a sign of anything that would make him wonder in the church he visited that Sunday morning. The only thing he saw was a deadness of ritual without any Holy Spirit fire. Whenever I read the book of Acts, I see again and again that the signs and wonders were not the exception during those first years of the Christian church. In fact, those signs and wonders were actually what was normal during that time. Healings and supernatural happenings occurred regularly and were even expected. I think we've lost some of that Holy Spirit expectation of power over the years. We need once again to discover the power of Pentecost. And we need to become a Pentecostal church. Ha! That got your attention! Now, I'm not talking here about a denominational bless to my brothers and sisters who are with the Pentecostal faith. I'm talking about an Acts chapter 2 kind of church. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and we need to be operating in the gifts of 
the Holy Spirit. We need to see people's lives turned around. We need to see people healed physically, emotionally, relationally, socially, and spiritually. And we need to experience the unity of the Holy Spirit as the early church did. We need to be living in a genuine love for each other. And when we fail at that, then we need to seek reconciliation. Folks, we just plain need to have some Holy Spirit fire fall upon us so that the people of God can rise up. Church, when God sends forth His Holy Spirit, amazing things happen. Barriers are broken. Communities are formed. Opposites are reconciled. Unity is established. Disease is cured. Addiction is broken. Cities are renewed. Hope is established. And people are blessed. If we let the Holy Spirit do what He wants to do in our churches today, we're going to see discouraged folks cheer up, dishonest folks fess up, conflicted folks make up, sour folks sweeten up, closed folk open up, gossipers shut up, sleeping folks wake up, lukewarm folk fire up, dry bones shake up, and we're going to see pew potatoes stand up. However, the most important thing that we will see when we let the Holy Spirit fire up His people is Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world lifted up. So this brings us to the first point about Pentecost power in the church. And that is that the Christian life is not about keeping rules, but about knowing Jesus. In too many churches today, going to a worship service is only about everyone dressing up and, and acting their best. And Christianity has just become about keeping the rules and being a good person. In churches all across the United States, the, the gospel of being good is being preached. In some places, it is translated as becoming say, politically active for social causes, or at least becoming concerned. In still other places, the measure of a person's Christianity is in how tolerant or inclusive they are in their acceptance of other people and ideas. However, the truth is, folks, until these churches renew their commitment to preaching that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through Him, they will not experience the presence of the Holy Spirit or know that spiritual zeal of the early church. The Apostle Paul explains perfectly about what the Christian experience is like in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Until the people of God renew their commitment to knowing the God they worship and live faithfully for him, they will not experience the power of Pentecost. The truth is, church, it's not about what we do here in this building or, or outside of it, but rather about what God does inside of us. Being a Christian is, is not about doing the right thing or believing the right doctrines, but more about knowing the right person. And that person is Jesus Christ. It's about banking everything we have and am on God and loving Him with our whole heart. And the Christian feeling, the Christian faith, is not a feeling. It's a reality. It is a real relationship with a real person, Jesus Christ. Christianity is about the most powerful and wonderful person in the universe who desires to know us intimately 
And the Christian experience should not be tame, but rather wild and powerful. So the second point I'd like to make is that Pentecost power comes when we realize that the Christian life is not just about salvation, but also about transformation. There are many churches who faithfully preach about salvation and the necessity of new birth. In fact, that's about all you hear every Sunday. The scripture changes, however the message is basically the same you need to be born again. And that is good for a necessary first step. However, if our faith only consists of a single event where we repent of our sin and come to Jesus, it's then an incomplete faith. Think of it this way. What if a baby was born and we all celebrated the new birth and the new life? However, what if from birth on we didn't nourish and nurture the baby? As wonderful as its birth was, that baby would not properly grow and develop and maybe not even survive. The Christian life also is not just only about being born again or just being baptized. A true Christian life is not just about salvation. It's also about transformation. To hear some people talk, you would think that once we come to Christ, we would just wait around and go to heaven. And that we're just putting in our time until Jesus comes for us. And if that's the way we think, we will never experience Pentecost power. We will never understand that, that Jesus has come to establish his kingdom here in this world. That's why we pray this verse every Sunday from the Lord's Prayer and from Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If Jesus prayed that and meant it, then we should too. And we are God's agents through whom he works to make that happen. We are to grow in holiness and be the salt and, and light in a tasteless and dark world. We are to become transformed on a daily basis through a continuous spiritual transformation. And then become agents of that transformation to the rest of the world. Think about it this way. If you take 10 gallons of gasoline and expose it to a flame, you'll have a release of a tremendous amount of power and energy. However, it is just a one-time dramatic impact. But if there's another way to release the energy in that gasoline, if I take that 10 gallons of gasoline and put it in my Subaru, which gets 35 miles to the gallon, all of those little explosions in the internal combustion engine of my car will get me 350 miles of driving. And the same holds true for every follower of Jesus as well. The most effective difference you can make in the world for the cause of God is, is letting the Holy Spirit use you over time instead of just one or two big events. God wants to empower us with his Holy Spirit continuously so that we can last for the long haul in building his kingdom. And the only way that can happen is by letting the Holy Spirit transform us on the inside so that we can be effective for him on the outside. Now the third point I'd like to make is that Pentecost power comes when you overcome apathy with zeal. If we call ourselves followers of Jesus, we absolutely have to grow in our relationship with him. And when that happens, the power of the Holy Spirit can then grow within us. But the thing is, we have to want to grow with Jesus. Folks, you can't be apathetic toward the things of God and his kingdom and expect to experience any kind of Pentecostal power. A true transformation within us 
can only start with the transformation of the heart that loves God and desires to know Him better each and every day. The more you know God, the more you will love Him. And the more excited you will be about His kingdom. And the more you experience God's presence and power, the more of it you will want. This is the way, the true way to the Christian life. So here's what all this comes down to. We have been forgiven. And we have inherited eternal life. And we have experienced eternal love. So, we then should hold nothing back because we've discovered a life that is worth far more than everything and anything else that we have seen or possessed. And because we are excited about our Christian life, we should also be excited about the wonderful God we serve. And so, be willing to do whatever it takes to have more of Him in our lives. We need to turn our apathy into zeal. There's a phenomenon occurring in our society today that as people thinking of God in what could be called a, an apathetic theology. Now this doesn't mean that people do not believe in God anymore. The good folks at the Barney Institute have made numerous surveys on this and have found that even today, 96% of people in America still have some sort of belief in a higher being who they choose to call God. The problem is that the God they believe in is just one of comfort and reassurance and not a God who asks anything of them. And that's what makes this kind of thinking an apathetic theology because there is this inclination to not really care at all about one's own religion. And worse, this apathetic theology has people caring even less about what other people believe in. People today have become completely non-committal in their belief systems and so look at religion as just one giant smorgasbord from which they can pick and, and choose the beliefs that most suit them. They then become the center of their own faith and adapt it to whatever they see as important in their lives and they don't care about anything else. And it is this kind of apathetic theology that will never allow a Pentecost power to develop within a church. So we need to turn and transform any kind of apathy about our relationship with Jesus into a zeal that can impact the world around us. And we can do that by getting rid of the stuff in our spiritual lives that causes any kind of apathy about our relationship with God. The Bible tells us this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Folks, it's that kind of commitment and zeal that will enable us to experience Pentecost power. When we're willing to get rid of the spiritual stuff that is holding us back, then the Holy Spirit will come down to us in new ways and light spiritual fires in each of our hearts. So as we celebrate this Pentecost Sunday, let's remember that to obtain Holy Spirit power within our church and in our lives, that it's not about keeping rules, but about knowing Jesus. It's not about just about salvation. It's also about transformation. And it's just that we need to overcome apathy with zeal. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your Holy Spirit which places a fire within us to explode out to help build your kingdom here in this world. Lord, help us to get rid of the apathetic theology that is not only running rampant in our world, but also within way too many church buildings. 
Help us, Lord, to get fired up and to rise up, to build your kingdom in our community, our city, our county, our country, and to the continents. And we pray this in the holy name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.